going to resume recording. So if anyone else wants to get a hold of this, then they can have it. So why don't we, for kind of a flow for tonight, just do kind of a quick introduction of who folks are. Then I'll pull up the GPX file route and we can kind of talk about the route specifically, um, you know, generally specifically kind of what to expect. Um, Jules will be leading it. So I'm sure there's some questions about gear and, you know, what exactly people want to have, um, what they need to have. You know, we've got some stuff available that folks can rent, beg, borrow, or steal. Um, I guess, I, mean, I guess kind of just kind of for just kind of a little bit of like a frame for this too, for this conversation. This is our first time doing a fast packing style trip. You know, I think everyone here has, has done trips with us in the past. Um, Debbie, what trip have you done? Wonderland. Wonderland, okay. With the we'll women's start. trip. With the women's trip, cool. Um, and so you're all pretty much familiar with our, you know, you know, glamp in the front country run in the back country. This will be, you know, we'll have some of that on the front end and the back end out of the campground, but, you know, we're going to spend some time out in the hills, which is, is exciting for sure. Um, yeah, so I guess where I was going with that is like, since this is our first time doing it, we only opened it up to alumni. We really want it to be a success. And, you know, you're kind of our quote unquote guinea pigs. Um, and so we want to support you in any way that we can. So if that's, you know, borrowing gear or, you know, whatever that looks like, we want to, we want to help you guys out. So, um, cool. So let's start with intros. Everyone knows me. Hi, I'm psyched for this trip. Eric, you want to go next? Sure, I'll go next. next uh, I'm Eric. I've done uh, three or four different things with Aspire. So looking forward to, to coming and doing another one. I'm out of Sacramento, so I'll be traveling up and um, just excited to do it. Cool. Jules. Uh, I'm Jules. I am living in Bellingham, and this will be my second trip with Aspire, my first lead but I've been guiding in the North Cascades, like in a mountaineering rock climbing context for the past five years. And yeah, have done some fast packing by myself, but not ever in a guided way. So I'm really excited for this. Cool, awesome. This is gonna be great. Um, Debbie. Uh, I'm Deb. I live in Bellingham as well. Um, like to go out and play in the Cascades as much as possible. I've done a little bit of fast packing, but first time, I guess, with the group. And I did Wonderland with the group, uh, with Aspire a couple years ago. Rachel. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. I'm in Seattle. And uh, this will be my third trip um, with Aspire. Um, I've done glacier travel. I, uh, summited Baker twice, and then I've done fast packing on the PCT, but I've never fast packed and summited a mountain before. So it'll be a new combination. Great combination. Great. <laughs> awesome. TJ. Yeah. Um, my name's TJ. Uh, this will be my third Aspire trip. I just got back from Yosemite a week, a little over a week ago. Um, did Wonderland a few years back, and I'm in Seattle. I'm new to the area, new to glacier travel. Um, I did St. Helens this past spring, and I've been to Camp Muir on Rainier, but this will this will definitely be the hardest thing I've done in terms of, you know, both fast packing and glacier travel. So I'm scared and excited. What a great combination. <laughs> <laughs> Jules, I know all these folks. They're all wonderful. I'm like super jealous that I'm not going to be on this trip. So <laughs> I think a lot of folks know Nick. He's he's shot a fair amount of photo and video for us. Um, and he'll be on the trip as well. Um, why don't I, I'll start just by um, kind of doing a screen share of the route. I'll talk about it in general terms. Um, Jules, if you want to just jump in with anything, feel free. Um, largely, this is going to be an overview of kind of the flow. And then I think most questions are going to kind of really be directed around gear. So we'll kind of, that will kind of segue right into that after this. 
Um, so let me share my screen. Um, cool. Can folks see? Should you should see some topography with some lines on it? Is that is that coming through? Yep. Um, fantastic. Okay. Um, so w the trip largely will be rendezvousing. Um, I should probably pull up my calendar so I know exactly what day this thing is starting. Um, Turns out we've got quite a few trips happening. Yeah, so Thursday night on the 5th, right? Does that match everyone else's calendar? So um, so Thursday night we'll rendezvous here at the Vidal campground. The Google map link is there in the, um, the runner, the course packet, course info packet. Um, I guess this might be a good time just kind of throw in a little plug. I know Eric is flying in from Sacramento um, TJ's in Seattle. I don't know if you guys are able to connect, you know, Eric's trying to avoid renting a car. Um, so maybe you guys can hang out for a little bit, kind of like post meeting and inside this, and you can kind of see if it works out to kind of carpool up. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I was looking at that's, that's a hitch for me. I was looking at rental cars and they're, they're wanting like $200 a day for a rental car. So yeah. it's, it's a little painful to, to think about that option. Yeah. yeah yeah no i'm glad to do it we could just coordinate times and yeah cool Great. appreciate that tj eric's a nice guy i'll vouch for him <laughs> thanks abram <laughs> um so people will make their way here to the bedell campground um we've you know we'll be coming down from bellingham deb if you want to jump in we can kind of like you know we can probably arrange for that to and from bellingham if that's easier for you um but we'll do our pretty standard dinner course overview. There'll be some instruction because there's going to be a little bit more complicated sort of information to kind of grapple with on this one. Um, in the morning, I'm sure we'll want to get an early start. We can kind of, I'll talk to Jules. She can kind of weigh in on what time she thinks that might be. But, you know, earlier is generally better for these sort of things because it is, you want to allow time for some instruction. We want to allow, to, we don't want to roll in in the dark. So, um, you know, an early start means sunrises and just more daylight to play with. So um, we'll start here sort of on the, um, the, uh, the Sauk River and the North Fork, come in a few miles and then climb up the Pilot Ridge and then work our way essentially all along the ridge here around Johnson Peak onto the PCT over here and then, sorry, the zoom is a little bit weird. Um, and then work our way onto the south ridge of Glacier Peak. Um, you know, so traditionally in, with the Spire courses, people are traveling at their own speeds and spacing out. Um, you know, my thought on this is, is we're kind of doing it, you know, beta testing first run is, you know, it's gonna be hard to do instruction if everyone's spread out. But also, I feel like there's probably can be some pretty natural regroup places, you know, Jules, you know, where, you know, oh, hey, well, let's, if people want to spread out, let's regroup here at the lake kind of a thing. Or, and then once you've kind of regrouped there, well, let's for sure regroup before we split out off onto this section of, of, of ridge. So, so you can kind of get a sense of the group and how they're moving and pacing, whether it's together or, or a little bit more spread out, but establish those kind of regroup kind of accordion style places that people will will expect to see you at. Um, night one will be up here on the high camp on the south south ridge of Glacier. Uh, we'll have an early morning start followed by a summit and then descend down sort of the, the Sitcom Glacier and then drop into the river valley climb up and then out on this ridge on day two. And then we'll do a post run sort of dinner situation that will be Saturday night. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap that evening and people will, will kind of drive to wherever they need to, they need to go Saturday night. Um, you know, again, I don't have a really strong sense of how long that'll be, but you know, it's, it's roughly two 20 mile days. So, um, so we're definitely not camping that last night. We're we're dispersing at that point. 
Um, we don't have, I, I don't have a reservation at the campground on Saturday night. They okay. were, they were unavailable. Um, okay. I looked at making a reservation. They just didn't, you know, because we added this late, I didn't make an early reservation. So I think if folks are tired and want to crash, then, you know, finding a place to do that would be an option. But our plan is to wrap after that sort of victory taco session okay. on Saturday night. Cool. Questions about the route? Jules, what do people need to have? I sent out a gear list, but I'm guessing there's going to be some questions about the specifics of those items. Yeah, before I jump into that, just to uh, further offer some more resolution to the lines drawn on the map and what Abram just shared is um definitely having some like regrouping spots because as soon as we leave the pct um yeah kind of right there it's definitely more off trail travel like there isn't so much of a trail there might be like a well traffic zone especially this late in the season but um it definitely becomes more of like how are we gonna get into this next basin and the next basin and most of those glaciers are pretty small leading up to glacier peak but there's definitely glacier travel along the way and um, that'll be kind of that section to camp will probably be more of a like move together section just to like give you that heads up and then same thing with sort of the summit and out and um I imagine that we will just be covering skills as they become necessary so that we can learn things and then you can go immediately and apply them as far as like using your tools that we'll talk about in just a moment. That's a, I really appreciate clarifying that. Like I would definitely expect the group to be traveling together on the off trail sections and that the independent travel would happen, you know, on the, on the, you know, the maintain established trail sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then uh, with gear, um, I have a couple of the like specialty items with me to show. The one thing I left was my harness, but um, I can describe that one too. Um, so my goal is that I'm probably going to fit all of this into like a 35 liter pack. Um, this guy. Can you show that again? Sorry, I was looking down. Yeah, yeah, here. Let's see. It's like a camp. Yeah, okay, pack. thank you. Um, and this one has like a a big entry, but I don't think that's totally necessary. I would say like, especially for moving on snow, if that's um, new for folks, something that I really like to do for my sleeping system is to waterproof it. Um, so that's gonna go like in the bottom of your backpack. And I have a dry bag that's about the size of the base of my backpack but using just a trash bag, like a contractor bag is really nice. Uh, you can cut it down to size, but anything that when you set your pack down on snow, that it's not gonna get anything wet if it's warm and things are melting, things like that. So I put a dry bag in there and then I'll shove in my sleeping bag, which is this big. Um, and there's a little like, um, I don't think I have it with me, but a little like silk sleeping liner, if you've seen those, um, that makes this like 20 degrees warmer. And those are pretty nice um, that I've found in my recent endeavors to just like block some more wind in addition to the baby sack and like hold the heat inside. Um, I don't think this one's even rated, but I feel like it's probably a 50 degree bag that becomes closer to a 30 degree bag with that. 
Um, yeah, and we'll be camping on rock. So then sort of like thinking about your sleep system as far as um, if you're gonna bring an inflatable pad, making sure that you have enough on the ground that it doesn't pop immediately. So this is the size of my baby sack and it's, it doesn't have any poles to it. It's just a bug net with like a wind layer and it's like semi waterproof. I have another one that's fully waterproof, but it doesn't have the bug net. So I'm imagining I'm gonna bring this one just depending on the, the weather. But it's basically just a sack that zips up and has a, a bug net for the face. And this material, if you like stomp out your uh, baby spot pretty well with your shoes before you lay everything down, you can kind of get any of the sharp rocks out of the way. And like, that's definitely one of those little finer points of like making sure it's all good if you're gonna bring an inflatable pad like that. I haven't decided if I'm gonna bring this yet. It's a really super thin foam insulated pad and it's really light. It's full length too and it provides some insulation from the ground. Um, it's definitely a lot thinner than the Thermarest things that you find um, that I've owned in the past. Um, and so it doesn't provide a whole lot of cushion but it definitely insulates you from the ground and can also be an extra barrier from those rocks. Um, so just some options. These are, I think you can get them for like 20 bucks at REI. They're like uh, MEC pads. They're just really thin. And they're usually this color yellow. And do you, you, you pair that with your inflatable pad, Jules? I do, yeah. Yep. And you I just, just strap it, it to the out. outside of your pack. It is on the outside. Um, if you have a little bit of a bigger pack, what you could do is like open this up and make a spiral around the inside of the pack and then stuff things inside of it. That works. And it also helps your pack stay like a nice shape too. So that's another way to try and pack it in there. Um, but it's it's pretty light and it's full length. So I've definitely just slept on that. It's not very comfortable. Um, and we're going to be running, so I'm going to bring the inflatable pad as well. I think it's worth kind of, I can put out a note too. Like we, like Aspire has um, ultralight sleeping bags and ultralight inflatable pads. So if, if anyone just wants to borrow one of those and use that, you know, you're, you'd be welcome to just shoot me an email. You don't need, unless, I mean, if you don't want to go out and buy that just for this trip, um, we've got pads and bags that are available. Another idea just to throw in there too, of like, with, there's so many systems you can have. If you have an inflatable pad that you're set on bringing, another thing that you could use instead of a foam pad to like make that surface uh, more protected from popping anything is a small sheet of Tyvek, like house wrap. If you cut it to size, you can just, that's super light and can also go down as a ground tarp and then uh, use that. Really just considering that, I've just, yeah, seen it, seen it like pop immediately and that sucks. So uh, just consider beforehand. And then as far as like clothing, I think that's pretty self-explanatory and just bringing um, what's necessary, right? And like trying to pare down as much as possible. I think one thing I'll, I'll kind of add too is just as folks are playing, there's, you can kind of think about your front country camping and your back country camping separate. Like you can bring a full or insulative pad and tent, you know, for that Thursday night 
and that can be it doesn't have to be the same system you're using you know for the for the back country and i guess an, another option too if if folks have tarps and you run with poles that can be a nice shelter as well um i don't think we're going to be dealing with um precipitation but um, if you have something wrapped around you, I think the wind is really kind of the the factor that the bivy sack or the tarp helps the most with is like wrapping it around you, but you could always build a little structure too with trekking poles. Jules, I have a couple questions yeah. regarding clothing and uh, bivy and that stuff. Um, so the bivy that you showed, there's one called the uh, Outdoor Research Helium bivy. It has that bug net. Is that, would that be That's appropriate for this? Yeah, that's the one that I have. Okay. And that's waterproof or it's not waterproof? It's, I think it's water resistant. Like okay. wouldn't hold up in a Cascadian downpour, but would provide protection from a small storm. Okay. Yeah. And, and then on this list, you have um, insulative jacket. Um, but I guess that's uh, insulative upper layer. So do you mean like a puffy or just like a mid-weight layer or what do, what do you mean by that? What I'm gonna bring for that is a pup, like a light puffy jacket, a small puffy that packs down well. And something that I've learned in the Cascades is having a blend of synthetic fibers and not just all down can be really nice, um, especially since we deal with a lot of wet, cold. So having something that is going to hold up, even if it gets a little bit wet, is can be a really nice thing if you have a insulated puffy jacket like that. And then on that note, would um, in a puffy plus like the insulated like puffy pants, could that take the place of a sleeping bag or is that not going to be enough? You could do that. Um, I've done that. I wouldn't say it was like okay. a very restful sleep, but okay. I think you puffy pants can be kind of big too. So I, I imagine that um, if you only have a really big sleeping bag, maybe talking to Abram about some of the sleeping bags that they have will probably be lighter than bringing puffy pants. Okay. Uh, but there, I think just trying to put them all together right like having some wind protection and then having a way that that body heat that you generate isn't going to just disperse so like my sleeping bag isn't the most robust but that little silk sack somehow holds all the heat in and does a really good job of that you mentioned you have a, a pad or a sleeping bag that's 50 and then you might get another 20 with that with that blanket. Uh, is that kind of what we should shoot for? Like something that's rated at 30 degrees or, or lower? That'd be a good target. Uh, I think so. I went up to the mountains three days ago and it was in the 30s at night and I had that bag and um, what I ended up doing because it was definitely on the line was just boiling some water and an algae. And that was fine for me to sleep with that at my feet. So I think it, it's really personal preference, but I would imagine that 30 degrees would be like the low that we could expect out there. And so just depending on like your, yeah, you have to either carry it while you move, you know, or like you sack, there's some trade-offs in all of this. So I don't know where everyone falls. Okay, that, that's helpful. Yeah. Suffer with the cold or suffer with the weight. <laughs> but yeah, having a hard-sided water bottle like that, even just a baby Nalgene or something that you could use like that can also be really helpful um, if your sleeping system is uh, bare minimum because you can add some extra heat that way. We'll definitely have stove to boil water 
if we need to do that. Yeah, so considering I usually bring one, just like I have all the soft sided water vessels, but going into the mountains, I usually bring one hard sided water carrying vessel just for that. And if your shoes get wet, you can dry out your shoes that way too. Can, do we need to bring um, gators, like traditional mountaineering gators or no? I don't think that's necessary. Yeah, running gators, if you have them, um, I probably will go without. So okay. That's my style. My shoes dry pretty fast and I'm definitely bringing extra socks. What about for your feet? I mean, some snow, light snow travel, I'd use like my running shoes, but then you mentioned um, crampons, but don't you need boots? No, so that's a good segue. Um, so I have, I would recommend getting a pair of crampons that strap on because you're not going to want to have boots. And uh, we need crampons because the mountain, it's glaciated. Um, I've been up there a little bit earlier than this time of the season. Um, but it's definitely steep and will be snowy or icy up there. And so being able to have some sort of front point on our feet will be helpful. Definitely like give us more security. And so um, these crampons, they're fully aluminum and they've got like cord that holds them together. So they, they're made a lot lighter. These are the Petzl Leopards but they just strap on. There's no um, metal bale in the front that requires a, a boot bale for it. And so they can strap onto any shoe. And um, I went up and tested this out just the other day on my trail runners. And um, there's a way that I can show you to tie these down. You like have to kind of feed the webbing through the the bottom cordage to like really strap it to your shoe, but it works pretty well. And you can definitely get traction if you cinch these things down really well. But they're aluminum and they fold up really small and they come in a bag like this. And you can also use any postal service bag. That works pretty well as a crampon bag or even if you have some straps on your pack to strap them to the outside, that works well too. Um, if you're gonna put them inside, be super careful about what you put them next to. Um, but yeah, these are what I'll be bringing. And crampons exist in many different forms. So I would just encourage you all to reach out if you find something like the strap on piece of it is probably the most important and then considering weight as well because there's some that have like some metal and some like a steel and aluminum hybrid type thing um, but having a fully strap onable cramp on that fits any shoe type is what we're going for jules when you say strap strap on you know that is are you referring to the cord along the bottom or the straps that go around your ankle no i'm referring to this white oh yeah yeah, yeah. okay so the front this white like okay. horseshoe and then the back as well when they aren't strapped the most common thing you'll see in the back is like a lever that right. locks in okay and in the front you would see like only a metal bar yeah and those don't accept any shoe type but okay. having this like rubber part so as long as it looks like that with the strap part and the bottom has like a metal bar that attaches the two crampon pieces that's okay that's fine okay yeah, yeah. i would encourage you to put them on your shoes yeah and just make sure that they fit but yeah there's definitely ways to make it feel more secure which we'll go over 
when we're all together. Because, yeah, it's, it's not a boot. It's not a rigid soul. What are you thinking about, uh, or what was your total pack weight when you went up there? Um, it was 25 pounds with my med kit and water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would shoot for like 30 or under. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, and then my ice axe, which is another one of those specialty items. Um, this is probably the one that I'm going to bring. Um, it's an aluminum shaft, which is important, um, I think, for the weight saving component in all of this. And then um, this ice axe is just a little bit more burly than I think the lightest ones out there. Um, and um, I have another ice axe too, if someone is in need of borrowing one, um, that's a little bit lighter. This one though, I can use as an anchor if I need to, because it's technically rated. So this is the one I'm gonna bring, but I think going for the lightest ice axe that you can find, and yours will probably have an ads, which is like a little shovel tip on the back. And that's great. Yeah, having that. And yeah, this one is, pretty small. Not sure actually how long it is. It's probably 45 or 50 centimeters. Yeah, it's probably 45. Um, and so just having something that can help your upper body connect to the mountain if it's icy or hard snow. You're going to teach us how to use those, right? And not kill ourselves with them? I will, <laughs> yeah. Yep, I'll teach you also how to stop yourself from falling with one of these. Yeah, like if you were to like start sliding, which we're going to manage all of that um, in a way that that probably won't happen, but so that you are also empowered to feel really good about your travel on the snow and ice. That brings up another question I have. How when you get near the summit of Glacier, how does the angle of the slope compare to like, say the Roman wall in Baker? Like how steep is the steepest stuff? So where the Roman wall is at right now, I wouldn't imagine that it's anywhere close to that. Um, we're probably gonna manage like a short, like hundred foot section of like steppy steepness where like there might be a 20 foot section of like 50 degree into like a bench where it's, you can hang out and chill and feel good on your feet. And then like another little steppy section. That's what I probably imagine it will be like late season, early season it was like that, but the snow you could kick steps into um, and so I've never actually seen it at this time of year, but I imagine that it'll be really manageable in that way. Just like short little steps, nothing like the Roman wall. Um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no helmets. Helmets are on the list. We will be bringing helmets. And so for that, having just a lightweight helmet, like probably really whatever you have, but a climbing helmet um, that's light and like the foam ones are great. Those are super light and you can move easily in them without getting a hot head. That's a nice thing to have. Helmets are not on the list. They should be on the list. That's yeah, it. since we're going to bring these like sharp pointy things up there, yeah. seems like a good idea. And then with the helmet, a harness or webbing to kind of create a harness. 
So like a hasty harness is okay? Yeah. So make sure that if you're going to do that, that you have at least 25 feet of tubular webbing. That's not like a truck bed tie down type of webbing. Like it actually is rated. So yeah. it'll be tubular. And with the harness, it doesn't need to be like a full climbing harness. I mean, it can be a very light glacial travel harness. You know, I mean, the one that I've got basically looks like lingerie. <laughs> you know, so it does not need to be a lot of harness. It would just simply keep you attached to the rope team. I'm not. I'm not interested in borrowing your lingerie, but I, but I would be interested in borrowing a harness. If I can make that happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Since I'm not going on the trip, I've got I've got the same pair of leopard crampons, a similar ice axe. So there's I don't have enough to outfit everybody, but I've got I've got a few pieces of equipment. If you're just like, man, I'm just testing the waters here. I'm not sure I want to like commit to all of this gear. Then, That's me, uh, with me in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. So I can I can definitely make. I've got some ultralight gear and some that's less light, but we'll totally, totally fulfill the need. So. Uh, day two. Uh, I assume running when you say running outfit, running shorts, short sleeves, those are fine. What about day two when we go actually up up the glacier? I think having some sleeves, whether that's like a wind layer, um, you're going to be moving. So it probably won't be your insulating layer. Um, but having sleeves when we're on the snow and ice will be something that I'm going to highly recommend, if not require, just because if you were to slip, um, the way that you stop yourself, your elbows are going to contact the snow. And so like making sure that we just keep ourselves um, yeah, in mountain mode. I'll probably just have a wind layer to wear for that. And so oh, then yeah. running shorts with rain shell pants are okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there will be an exposed trail for a big part of that initial summit climb. It's like leaving camp, we'll have probably an hour of trail travel before we step onto the ice. And so then from there, uh, we'll likely keep moving, but like a little bit slower pace probably than the trail miles and move into like that short technical bit to the summit and then descending from there. And then we'll definitely have time to like transition out of mountain movement all of that do you think so for pants do you think um do you think we need to bring the sort of soft shell mountain pants or if we run in tights is that enough for the whole thing um uh, abram will you just scroll up on what you sent in the packing list uh... Rain or shell pants. Down a rain slash shell pants. Okay. Is there glissading at all? Probably not. Okay. It's going to be pretty hard. Yeah, I think the snow is going to be pretty hard. I would say that um, kind of like Abram was talking about having a front country scene and then your back country scene, like put your water resistant pants your shell pants in your camp bag and I think based on like our weather forecast if it looks super dry like I might opt for more of a soft shell like lighter like wind paint like would that. wind pants work if it's good weather with something underneath them yeah yeah like some leggings and like yeah. something to just cut the wind But I would still pack that stuff. Okay. Just like have it as an option until we're ready to launch. Yeah, that's definitely a great strategy. I feel like 
you've got a couple pieces of gear that you're sort of deciding between based on weather, based on temperatures, based on conditions, like put all of that in your duffel for the front country. And then I would expect there'll be another, you know, pretty in-depth session you guys will have from the campground Thursday night. Just like, okay, how do we put this all of this gear into the pack in a way that you can move with it? And then there'll be that decision moment there that night of like, okay, this is going to go, this is going to stay. Mm -hmm. And definitely um, the warm hat and gloves is super important. And I would say also like if your sleeping bag is, if your sleeping system is kind of on the, like on the fringe and having a, a warm buff to wear can be really nice. Um, just like sleep. Have That's kind of an important thing to kind of just get, well, just kind of another point too. If you are, if your bag is on the lighter side of things, you know, it's a 40 degree bag and it's 30 degrees you know, wearing that, those shell pants, wearing that puffy jacket, you know, all of that, just wearing that to bed is, that's going to buy you some, that's going to give you, give you some warmth as well. Mm -hmm. When you say warm hat and gloves, or running gloves enough, or would you need like the winter gloves, like snow gloves? I would bring something beyond just like the lightest pair of running gloves. Um, something not like a really burly pair of gloves, but something in the middle with a little bit of insulation or like a wind stopper type fabric, just something a little bit more, um, just because we will be moving up on snow and um, it'll probably be warm in the day, but if your gloves get wet or something and then sleeping I find that having all my layers on as Abram said is really like how this becomes possible to move quickly with all my gear I'm like using it all to sleep as well are there going to be any river crossings uh, yes yeah I can go back to the map like for sure crossing this creek, or the, what is this guy? This is the White Chuck River. Like there's gonna be a river crossing here. On sure. the way out. On the way out. And then I'm not sure if there's a bridge here. I bet there probably is crossing the North Fork of the Sock. Mm -hmm. report on this is that this will be a more kind of remote river you know i wouldn't expect a bridge to be here on the white chuck so and then just like the mountains right now there's a lot of water gushing around so i imagine that in some of those basins there, there will be water and we'll be maneuvering around it. I don't think there's really a, uh, a trail. Like I said, from the PCT, um, before when I was there, it was all snow and glacier. So uh, we didn't see any of the trail, but I do think that just similar to how the Cascades are, once things melt out, there's like a, a way that people have gone that kind of is a trail, right? But then there'll probably be patches of snow that we'll navigate and stuff like that. Cool, this is super great, Jules. Um, what, are the, what are the questions that people have? Mm -hmm. Oh. Silence on all the ends. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, this is really exciting. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of uh, so. I, I mean, I think folks know this, but I came, I came to running more from a mountain and climbing, you know, genre than a you know running track and roads and field. Like, like my my entry point to trail running came from high country into trails and. 
and have always been really inspired by, you know, movement in the Alpine. Um, I mean, it's been, it was so special being in the Sierra while we were doing the Yosemite trip, got a chance to do some great kind of off trail link ups. Um, the Cascades are full of so many great options and routes that when you can compare, you can combine your fitness, which all of you have really strong bases of fitness, like you really, each of you do, um, with some really kind of relatively fundamental mountain travel, glacial travel, navigation skills. Um, there's a lot of opportunity that comes up to get into some really beautiful alpine terrain. And it's really empowering um, and exciting to, you know, kind of leave the trail, get into the alpine, and feel confident that you have the skills and the tools you need to kind of navigate some of those sections. And I feel like Glacier Peak is this, this perfect, perfect way to kind of blend these two things, you know, doing, you know, a 40 mile, you know, two days is, is a big day and that would definitely require some fitness, um, you know, and, and the terrain will require navigation. It will require these fundamental skills, but it's, it's terrain that's not so overwhelming and so, overly complicated that it's a great a great place to learn and practice and develop these skills and Jules is someone who's spent a lot of time in the high country and, and has spent a lot of time guiding and I'm just super super excited to have her leading this trip um, and uh, yeah it's gonna be super fantastic so really excited for all of you to kind of be part of this inaugural fast packing sort of opportunity I'm not sure how much running is going to happen with 25 pounds on my back. I usually tell me super fast, <laughs> but I'm super excited. So I just not going to be very fast. Yeah. I mean, but a long probably, day doesn't scare me. Yeah. All, as you all know, like fast is never really what we're trying to accomplish. You know, it's like, it's having, having the fitness for a long, steady day. You know, it, and it really will be kind of finding that all day pace, you know, and, and keeping that going for the duration. And so, yeah. Yeah. And this zone too is just such a special part of the Cascades as well. It's really remote. And I've heard that Pilot Ridge is amazing. Yeah, I'm so excited. I've only taken the River Valley before, and that is beautiful, second growth. And yeah, to get up high and, and see the zone in a new way and um, getting back to Glacier Peak, that is, um, yeah, the last time I was there, there was a snowstorm that came in right before our summit day, and I saw fresh wolverine tracks just right off the summit ridge. And I'd never before seen Wolverine tracks, but it was just totally, I knew it immediately and then confirmed with the Wolverine people, you know, but it's just incredible to see those tracks and that presence out there and it just really speaks to how wild it is. And it's super cool that we're all going to go out there. <laughs> Great. I'm guessing we'll have bugs down below, but maybe not up high but what was that but i'm guessing that we'll have bugs on the front country but maybe not the back country as far as like bug netting and all that yeah i'm hopeful that we won't have bugs in the alpine where we're hoping to camp um, is sort of a gap and and that's our goal of where we'll be camping and so i don't think there will be bugs there although I don't know I do know that we'll travel through basins where there is still water there's lakes so it's possible and we'll just have to figure that one out together mm -hmm. <laughs> great well Jules this has been awesome I really appreciate your time really appreciate everyone chiming in and being present um if there are other questions, you know, feel free to, you know, shoot me an email. Um, if you want, you know, again, like I'm happy just to loan out my gear and loan out the Aspire stuff that people have just to kind of make this a, a success and then, you know, use it as, as a learning opportunity and, and, and kind of 
welcome your feedback, you know, along the way. So as we kind of make this a more official kind of offering in the future, then you can have more, more of your feedback. Um, yeah. So just shoot me, shoot me an email for what, what you need. Um, is there any kind of, I'll kind of give one more last round for opportunity for questions. Cool. Um, Eric and TJ, should I just connect you guys via email or how do you guys want to do that? Or do you want to just chat a little bit? I can let everybody go and you guys could connect. Um, yeah, Eric, whatever you prefer, I mean, email's fine and we can swap cell phone numbers, whatever you want to do. Yeah, that, that works great actually. Do you just want to take my number down? Sure, yep. 